I will be maybe on the same line uh, of Jeffrey because uh, what is quite important actually is to understand that when we have to test the patients. This was a question that was re raised in the previous session and working in a phase one unit, uh, I must tell you that we do a lot of NGS because many of our trials are finally designed on a specific molecular alteration. So first of all, we have to understand that there is an evolution of molecular testing and uh, in a few years, uh, we have availability of many technology platform. Secondly, someone is raising concern about the cost and the time, but if you look at the time to perform a testing, it went from 13 years for the genome project, the first paper, to, to less than one day. So it's quite important, this point, and the cost is very low. With less than 1,000 euro, you can really perform an NGS testing. I believe that overall the panel test uh, uh, or the panel size is quite important because if you concentrate in a very low number of genetic alteration, you will miss something. So you will miss the opportunity for the patient to access to a clinical trial. So, so the more large is the panel, the more opportunity we give to the patient to access to a clinical trial. And we have a bidimensional evaluation here at the deep of uh, sequencing and the dimension of the panel. These are two important messages, I believe. And finally, the patient selection. So what stage is the patient's disease? Can the patient wait for targeted therapy? Can the patient get a targeted therapy? So when do we have to sequence a patient? I will provide some examples that are really clinical practice because we have patients in many settings of treatment. Of course, we should consider the extensive genetic heterogeneity. We know very well that in the context of the tumor, we have several clones, and the clonal selection induced by a specific treatment will select according to tumor evolution specific clones that will be resistant to the previous line of treatment. So this is an hypothesis that should induce us to sequence a patient at any progression of disease. This can be a statement. So access to testing is a major limitation. In Italy, we don't have a genomic platform. This morning, uh, it has been presented, the project of Alleanza contro il cancro, but up to now, there is nothing. And exactly also in Spain, there is nothing in Germany. So in many countries of Europe, there is no access to NGS in the context of a reimbursement of the national health system. The only two countries that have a genomic platform are UK, that's why I invited you, and France. That's why I invited Christophe and Fabrice to speak about their experience. The final end point of this meeting is to increase awareness in the context of European Union. We are not like the United States. So also increasing knowledge and awareness should be an end point of a, of a meeting, of a scientific meeting. So finally, identification of cancer drivers. How many hospitals in Italy have a molecular tumor board? We don't have in our hospital. Every time we perform an NGS, uh, I discuss, uh, Luca maybe is not here, with our molecular biologists, with the bioinformaticians, and we try to define which one of the genetic alteration that we identified is the most appropriate to select the treatment because we have a phase one unit. And I worked a lot in the last years to have uh, in parallel 40 to 50 phase one in order to offer an opportunity to the patient. You cannot run a phase one unit with four trials or five trials. You need minimum 35, 40 trials ongoing. And this is a, this is a way to identify variant prioritization. These are tools that are available online, and you can interrogate them in order to understand if a specific alteration can be more probably the higher driver alteration respect to another. Or in some cases, I remember a very rare tumor that we had, a very rare tumor, in which we identified a notch mutation, and we proposed to this patient a clinical trial in the context of a phase one. 
So access to therapy, at least in Europe, is a problem, finally. We, we try, of course, uh, to build uh, some tools, uh, like the precision trial designer that was mentioned this morning, in order to increase the probability of allocation. But finally, if you don't have the phase one trial or you don't have that specific access to the molecule, it will be a problem for the patient. But don't forget the opportunity that the NGS offered to you, because if you will identify a microsatellite instability high in the context of any solid tumor, you can guarantee to the patient the access to an immunocheckpoint inhibitor. And you can do also in the context of expanded access program. So usually we stop uh, the opportunity to access to an innovative treatment to the patient just because we don't ask. Because believe to me, I identified some specific alteration and in some cases I asked it to the company to provide the agent and in most of the cases they can provide to you. Also if the agent is off label, not indicated for that disease or not registered. We have a patient that is receiving imatinib, we identified a CKIT alteration with foundation medicine, is not a GIST, is not a chronic myeloid leukemia, but the patient receive it, imatinib. So uh, we need to be more provocative and more innovative. That's why tomorrow I invited a representative of IMA and IFA, because uh, you know that IMA did not approve it, immunocheck point for microsatellite is unstable. It's really, I cannot understand this. FDA approved it, and IMA decided not to approve. So why so many differences between uh, United States and Europe. So uh, these are all the research implications of NGS. I believe it's an opportunity for the patients. So you should ask an NGS. And uh, what's about genetic testing registry? This is a very interesting uh, 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 article published a few uh, days ago in a, in a Canadian magazine. That I am a Canadian citizen, that's, I, that's why I read this. And Sunil Verma sent to me this. This is the Globe and Mail. No, it's in English, but it's very interesting because uh, Canada has a national health system, exactly like in Italy. So this is the genetic testing registry and the number of registered labs globally. They are 504. And the national initiative are the Canada's Personal Genome Project. I will mention some results the USA Precision Medicine Initiative. We listened about uh, uh, Estonia. The Big Data Najing Center in China. Finland also will have a program. Britain already have. And then we have Turkey and Israel DNA sequencing program. So these are the only country in the world that in real life, in clinical practice, will offer an NGS testing to the patients. Which type of NGS testing, of course, it's different from country to, to country. It's a national-based platform. What's about number of registered labs by country? This is quite interesting. We have 256 in the United States. Then if we go in Europe, we have eight in France, seven in Belgium, 18 in Britain, UK. In the rest of the world, 96. I did not find, uh, because if you look on the original manuscript, you can match on the, on the numbers, in Italy there is nothing. So in our country, we don't have a lab that is registered to perform this type of testing. So I believe this is quite an important problem because um, if you look at the scenario of drug development in the last five years, more than 30 new uh, th uh, pharmacological entities have been approved, based on a phase one, expanded phase two. So in the same trial, you have target validation, assessment of clinical utility of the target, and drug development. It's interesting, this. And in some cases, NGS uh, brought to the discovery of new target. If you think about the HALC history, the NTRAC history, the microsatellite instability history, just retrospective analysis discovered validated biomarker that predict response to new agents. So we absolutely need a genomic platform, any type up to now, because if we don't have, we deny access to innovative treatment to the patients. 
Innovation matters in our world. I know that there are a lot of approved agents, but we need to foster in the future also our country. So this is the most common somatic mutations observed from the MD Anderson. This is an interesting paper. They have an institute of personalized medicine. They sequenced thousands of patients. It's quite interesting that across the program of the MD Anderson, they identified several molecular alterations, most of them with the potential of access to clinical trial or to standard of care. And why? Because the current drug development paradigm is completely different respect to the past. You have a phase one, in the same phase one, you assess the safety, the preliminary anti-tumor activity, the evidence of a specific target, and you identify predictive biomarker of response or resistance. That's why we need uh, an accrual in a phase one trial, not in late stage of disease. But it's better to propose for a phase one a patient in first, second line, rather than in fifth line of treatment. And for any trial, a biopsy is mandatory. And for any one of these biopsy, an NGS will be performed even if there is no target identification in the context of the trial. And for all the trials with immunocheckpoint inhibitors that we are actually conducting in my center, we have a baseline biopsy, a biopsy after a few weeks at response of disease and that progression of disease. Because we need information, we need to understand how to identify patients most responsive. There are a lot of adaptive trials I strongly believe in the adaptive trial and the model of breast cancer, the iSPY2 trial, it's outstanding. It's a very, very nice trial. You have several arms in which you test the activity of uh, specific agents. To a specific agents is matched the specific gene signature. So with a very few number of patients, you validate the target, you identify predictive biomarkers of response in the context of NGS. And in case of residual disease in the context of the tumor, you can resequence residual disease and you can identify markers of resistance. And this is very flexible. This is a master protocol in the neo one setting because if you don't have activity of one agent, you can change the agent on the same pathway. And don't forget that according to FDA, a new agent can be registered in the neo one setting if you can demonstrate an increase of PCR rate, of pathological complete response rate. So, a high level integration between drug development, next generation sequencing, and of course, registration of an agent. It's impressive. In a very short time, you can achieve a lot of results and you can accumulate a lot of information. That's why we need to foster this field, at least in my country. We don't have absolutely now the capability to do what they are doing in France and UK. And so we need to raise awareness also at the political level. This should be a political decision. This is another model, a genome forward trial. I believe it's outstanding. Matthew Ellis is doing a lot of trials with this model, uh, also performing full genome sequencing. It's quite interesting. This is a very interesting trial. This is a patient in which you perform a baseline biopsy. If you have a mutation of PI3 kinase, you will receive a PI3 kinase inhibitor plus endocrine therapy. If you don't have, you have a CDK46 inhibitor trial. So it's not correct that in the context of a trial, if you don't have an agent, the patient will lose the possibility to access to innovative treatment. You need a backup arm. So if you have another arm, you can allocate the patient. So you need to create and to generate the master protocols. And in the future, for all the trials, we will have two questions. Or to enrich the population in order to select the niche of patients that will be really responsive to that specific treatment, the n track experience. Let's say they perform at the huge molecular screening around the world to identify all the patients with the n track fusion protein. And then they have 50, 60% response rate in these patients. Or you can stratify. You can perform a retrospective analysis interrogating the database of foundation medicine 
in all the patients that receive the specific treatment. So it's quite important enriching or stratifying. And if you enrich, you will give a clinical benefit to the patients. That's why it's so important to do a molecular screening. And these are some experience of clinical trials all around the world, the CREATE of ERTC, the TAPUR just presented, the WINTER. Of course, the more advanced is the platform of sequencing, the more opportunity you will offer to the patient. Christophe this morning presented the date of the first trial, but the panel that he used is not, is not comparable to the panel that we have today. So this is the economics of a phase one. Uh, 250 centers involved, uh, very complex trial. You need a logistics that is a nightmare. Increasing cost for patient, and usually you treat from one to two patients per clinical trial. So the experience on that single agent is very limited. We screened, I remember, 141 patients to identify two patients with FGFR amplification and PI3 kinase mutation in order to be enrolled in a clinical trial combining these two agents. That's why we need master protocol. So the idea for also the Italian platform is to integrate the genomic platform with the large master protocol across solid tumors or in a specific disease, creating partnership with the pharma either in terms of sequencing, either in terms of, uh, of drug development. It's important to generate this type of partnership. I have to be honest. We cannot do research without partnership with pharmaceutical company. If, if you look at the, the papers published every week, I, I have an intensive activity as an editor in many journals. I cannot find uh, less than 10% of the manuscript usually are just academy driven. In most of the cases, you have collaboration between industry and between academy. It's important to foster this collaboration because this will create opportunity for science, but also for clinical research. This is a trial. Inclusion criteria, PI3 kinase mutated, P10 loss, CMET amplification over two amplification. It's impossible if you don't have an NGS platform. You cannot fish any single, uh, any single molecular alteration, but these are trial of the real life. And this patient will respond to a specific combination. So in my opinion, enrichment and patient selection is important. We need to test the patients, also in the early breast cancer setting. And we need to also to identify that rare subset of patients with the so-called private mutations. Also for them, there is a therapeutic opportunity. This is the experience of uh, the Canadian platform. Uh, Philippe Darda pro mm, provided to me these slides. Uh, as you see here, they sequenced uh, almost 2,000 patients, and they are located to clinical trial, 20% eh? of them. They are doing a, a, an outstanding job, of course. And uh, the, the Canadian government is investing a lot of money on this type of approach. And we need also to do this in Italy. And if you look at specifically the best tumor shrinkage, it's quite clear that you have a response rate. And in some cases, you have longer duration response rate. I believe also that liquid biopsy in the future will be important to understand tumor evolution. And uh, when you have a progressive disease, uh, of course, uh, maybe liquid biopsy can provide many information on the mechanisms of resistance to the previous treatment. So I strongly believe in a multi-gene testing on liquid biopsy, assessing many molecular alteration in order to offer new opportunity to the patient in terms of standard of care. This is a, an example of clonal evolution this slide was presented by Peter Campbell in St. Gallen two years ago. It's quite, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to understand how many molecular alteration at the same time you have in a single clones of cells progressing to an endocrine therapy. So identifying branch that are specifically resistant to a previous treatment will, will offer an opportunity to discovery because we will increase knowledge. We will understand which are the mechanism of resistance underlying a previous treatment. And if you discover a new pathway, 
you can generate data also to generate new agents. It's quite important. So the future of drug development, I, I believe, will be a strong integration with the genomic platform. So we need much more artificial intelligence, I believe, to, to evaluate many, many concepts at the same time. And what we can do for the future is to design trial with 80,000 patients. So, you know, still many people believe that in order to demonstrate the activity of an agent, you need a large prospective randomized trial with thousands of patients. We need a new continuum for genome forward approaches. They are quite important. We need new strategies for biomarker driven clinical trials. And we need to collaborate a lot with molecular pathologists and bioinformaticians. There is really a need to integrate all this data. So this is the precision medicine clinic for the future. So this was the classic assessment. Giancarlo, believe to me, it's not for you, in which you, you have the GPS to decide treatment according to immunohistochemistry, FISH, or single PCR. Or you can, you can perform a comprehensive molecular profiling integrating NGS, proteomics, immunosignature analysis, liquid biopsy, and analyzing all this data with the molecular tumor board. So thank you.